Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to ZTV Live. I'm Susan Mulligan Fleischman, and today is Wednesday, September 29th. Hope everybody is having a wonderful day. It was great to feel those cool temperatures out there today. Fall is on its way. I know it's here, but I think it's actually temperaturally, if that's a word, on its way. Tonight is our favorite literary editor show, Ralph Pelusa with Reading, Writing, and Ralph. Hey, Ralph, welcome back. Hi, Susan. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing great, and you're here on a special night tonight. A very special night. It's Wednesday instead of Tuesday. I just got back from a river cruise. Um, if it wasn't for the 24 fabulous people I was with, uh, it could have been a real nightmare. <laughs> but everything turned out okay, and we're all safe. Um, Good. As uh, luck would have it. Good. And Thank how you. about yourself? Good. Great. I were just... Uh, um working and uh, I actually was out of town last week had saw some uh, dear friends of ours and uh, had a wonderful time and uh, again I'm just um, I could really feel that co little cooler snap in the air this morning when I went outside it felt really great good yeah I got out in golf today um, finally after 10 days but uh, good How'd you play? I played like I never stopped playing <laughs> excellent <laughs> I hit the you ball. Go, well, that's 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 fantastic. It's just like riding a bike. It sure is. It yeah. sure is. But anyway, we have a uh, another terrific guest on tonight, Rob Krupika, um, who uh, was in public service for a while, elected office, I believe, in Alexandria, and mm -hmm. uh, he's uh, written a marvelous collection of a hundred poems. And um, he is our first poet that we've had on. Oh, fantastic. So again, let let me bring special, him on the screen. Very yeah. special night. Hey, Rob. Here welcome he to ZTV. Hi, Hi Rob. Rob. Hi, Susan. How, How are you, you all doing tonight? tonight? I'm doing, doing great. great. <laughs> it's uh, cool. It's starting to get dark earlier. Um, so there's not as much going on in the evenings in the communities as it has been. But um, it's, you know, every day you wake up um, and you're standing upright and you can go out and play golf. How bad can the day be? Right. Exactly. That's right. Pretty, pretty good. Pretty good. I'm going to let you guys take uh, take the conversation from here. Okay. Well, welcome, Rob. As I was telling um, Susan and our, our viewers, you are our first poet to be on. So it's it's really good. And we've had uh, authors w from children's books to uh, uh, guidebooks to wines to all sorts of things. But you are the first poet. So congratulations. That's, that's great. Well, I appreciate that. I, I didn't know that. If I... If I had done that, maybe I would have uh, uh, pushed to do this faster or earlier. I, I'm uh, I'm honored to be the first poet. Oh, great, good, good, and, and we look forward to hearing your insights and your thoughts. It's I always like to um, have the author speak about themselves so that our our, uh, our audience can get a feel for who you are and what you've been doing, what your life's been like. So why don't you tell us? about your background um, and um, uh, what you're doing today and then also your political career and, and how that sort of uh, led you to, you know, untangling grace. Okay, that, absolutely. Um, so I'm not a native Virginian. I grew up on the West Coast, came out here to go to college at UVA and uh, kind of stuck in Alexandria after I graduated. Um, I had the good fortune of serving on the local Alexandria City Council for about nine years and, and the House of Delegates for three years. Those are great honors and it was a just enormous opportunity to be able to serve this community. I really enjoyed it and uh, you know Alexandria is a special place. The community here is really involved civically and being able to be a public official in that kind of environment is just is, is something that I felt really fortunate to be able to do. Uh, I uh, a few years ago, uh, actually, let me take a step back. I, I've always written poetry. Um, some people journal. I, I write poems, and I, I write them on pieces of scrap paper. I write them on napkins. <laughs> I write them on my phone. Uh, most poems actually end up on my phone in one form or another and then uh, make their way into some kind of more formal um, formal document. But the, but, but about five or six years ago, I kind of found myself going through a real uh, number of changes in my life. I had left public service. Um, 
I found out actually that I was diagnosed as having bipolar condition, which is very well managed now. And, and I feel lucky that I'm able to do as well with it as I, as I am. Uh, but that, that happened. Uh, I was going through a divorce that was uh, significant. And all of these things kind of came to a head all within a very small period of time. And uh, that was that was tough. And, and they were the kinds of things that really challenged you to think about yourself and look inward and reflect. And for me, uh, a, a lot of that took its form in writing poems. Uh, and I started writing poems every every day or two. Sometimes I'd write three or four a day. Uh, and over the course of doing that, I discovered uh, that I really was interested in this idea of grace. And I, uh, I started incorporating that into all the poems I was writing. And that's kind of how I got from, um, from politics to poetry, I guess. <laughs> politics to poetry. That might be a good title for your next book, Policy, uh, Politics that, to Poetry. Uh, that's but, right. Uh, before we get into uh, untangling grace in the poems themselves, um, Tell the folks about your business in, in Virginia, your two uh, businesses that you run. Yeah, absolutely. I, so I run a donut shop that a lot of people in Alexandria know called Elizabeth's Counter. Uh, it's also a cafe. It serves donuts and also uh, lunch and breakfast offerings. Uh, and I also own a, a bar right next to Elizabeth's Counter called Captain Gregory's. It's a high-end speakeasy cocktail lounge. And the two businesses have struggled, as all restaurants have during COVID. Uh, but I'm fortunate that they're still standing and uh, we're able to serve the community still. It's um, the last 18 months have been a challenge, uh, but the staff I have is, is great and I'm lucky to have them. And we have wonderful customers who are loyal and have kept us going during some tough times for restaurants in the last uh, two years. Yeah, they certainly have been, and the, and the perseverance to hang in there um, is, you know, is tough uh, to go through that. But Ca uh, Captain Gregory has an interesting story as it relates to the donuts, so share that with the with the audience as well. Absolutely. So uh, it may not seem to uh, someone just kind of coming in off the street that Elizabeth Counter and Captain Gregory's are uh, tied together, but but they're tied together more than just physically. Their names are actually tied together. Uh, Captain Gregory is named after a real uh, person, a historic figure from the 1800s, who was a Maine sea captain. His name was Hanson Gregory. And he used to go to sea with provisions packed by his, uh, his mom, Elizabeth. So Elizabeth would pack food for Captain Gregory. They'd go to, he'd go to sea. And oftentimes that food included donuts, which uh, at the time, donuts were a, just a mound of dough that was fried that had nuts in the middle of it. That's where the name Donuts came from. And Captain Gregory one night during a very turbulent uh, seas, uh, spears his donut on the ship's wheel. And he has a eureka moment and he says, oh my goodness, I gotta tell my mom about this. So he goes home and he tells his mom, if you put a hole in the donut, that soft part in the middle will go away and we'll cook the donut more evenly. And Elizabeth was the first person to ever cook a donut with a hole in it, Elizabeth Gregory. Uh, so Elizabeth's counter is named after the mom who cooked the donut and the speakeasy next door, uh, Captain Gregory's is named after the son who came up with the idea of the hole in the donut. <laughs> That's a fabulous story. It's uh, so, I think everyone's getting a little chuckle out of that one, I hope. Yeah, um, no, it's a good week. And it's tr there's a picture of Captain Gregory's in Captain Gre in, in the bar. There's a picture of him, and he is a real-life person. There's a statue of him in Maine somewhere. I've not seen the statue yet. I need to do a pilgrimage up there. But there is a statue of him in existence. That's that's great. So um, we uh, let me remind the audience, we have three trivia questions tonight, um, as usual. Uh, the first person in with the right answer will get an autographed copy of Untangling Grace. And um, before we get into um, Rob's uh, uh, background, his style of writing and all that, we're going to ask the first trivia question. And that is, who penned the line, it's better to have loved and lost than not to have loved at all? So again, who is the author who penned the line, it is better to have loved and lost than not to have loved at all. 
and the first woman in with the correct answer. So, so Rob, you 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 wrote poems starting at an early age. Um, who do you think your style influencers were in in writing poetry? So early on in like in, in high school, I would have said E. E. Cummings. I really liked um, kind of the way he broke down conventions when it came to grammar and and, and structure. And I really liked the simplicity of a lot of his poems. So that was probably one of the first poets I had. I had an E. E. Cummings book in high school, and I really I cherish that book. Uh, in college, I got to see W. S. Merwin speak. Took a poetry class and um, be, began to really appreciate. Um, again, very simple, tight prose. I really like, uh, I like, I have a, I have a Facebook page called, um, with few words. I like poetry that has really a lot of meaning without a lot of, a lot of words. Uh, and I, I think there's power in being able to be concise in that way. So I, so the authors I kind of think about is I, I, I think about, uh, Merwin, I think about, um, Mary Oliver, I think about um, Pablo Nuerta um, and E. Cummings and, uh, and, and a, a number of others. I get sent poems all the time and I, I like to read them, but I really appreciate poems that have a really tight prose to them. Well, and that's in my style is that my style doesn't use a lot of punctuation and it, it doesn't use a lot of a, a lot of words. Uh, it, it's very it, it's pretty compact and the poems are typically pretty short. Yeah, it's interesting how the 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 writers, uh, whether you're a novelist or a, a fiction writer, you have you have to cr use more words to create the images, and then you've got the biographers and the nonfiction writers; they have to use the facts to create the images, and then you have poetry over here, as you just described it. You've got to create uh, um, the message that you're you're setting out in, in such a tight uh, pattern with your words that it's truly an art form that I think a lot of people may overlook. Yeah, I paint a little bit in my free time and I've, I've, um, I've got paintings that I've done all over my house. And I find, or I often describe poetry as painting with words, where you're trying to kind of evoke a feeling or a, a, a sense of something uh, with as few words as you possibly can so that you don't overwhelm or, or cloud them out or, or cause uh, there to be too much chaos going on. So it's a, it really does feel like an art. It, it, um, and typically I do it in the morning. I do it right after I wake up. And I typically start by doing poetry writing on my phone. I'll hash out some ideas on my phone and then I will later look at those poems that I've hashed out on my phone and I'll convert them to a blog I have. I have an anonymous blog online that I don't tell anyone, I don't tell anyone who, who it is behind it. it. It doesn't have my name on it, but I use it as my trial run for all my poems. So I put all my poems up on my anonymous blog and I wait and see how people react to them. Wow. <laughs> um, it's, a way, wow. it's a way to get unfil unfiltered feedback without having to without having to put my face forward. And then after I, after I see the feedback I get, I then take those poems and I edit them again. And then they find that that's how they find their way to a finished form. Right, right, that's great. And we have a winner. We have a, a first winner of the night. Oh, wow. That was quick. We do have, we do have a winner and it is um, our own Kelly McConomy. Uh, she first said uh, Tennyson, and then immediately she wrote Alfred Lord Tennyson. So she she got the full name. Congratulations, Kelly. Thanks for playing. Uh, Rob Kelly also said hi, as did Paul Vogel. Uh, said a very nice hello to you as well. So just FYI. Hi, and Kelly and Paul. Yeah. <laughs> and Lucelle. It's good to see Lucelle's Kelly back. Also. Uh -huh. It is. And Lucelle, yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, so let's... Um, Let's talk about grace and what grace yeah. means to you. And because um, you said something earlier, and I think may play into uh, how you, how you came up with grace. You said when you were in political office, winning was a great experience, and losing was a great experience. I think that's what you said. And so yeah. both ways you got fulfilled by that. And, and and grace is sort of that. It's it's kind of a gift from God, and it makes people feel fulfilled and blessed. So. What does grace mean to you, and how did how did you uh, run with it through your poetry? So, uh, looking back on it, you know, you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Well, self, where where self 
um, actualization is kind of the highest um, tip of the pyramid, right? Um, so self-actualization and grace go hand in hand. I, there is a real need as you kind of go through life uh, to recognize uh, the beauty that's all around you and beauty in things that aren't always beautiful um, initially. And I, I, I really struggled with that. And as I was going through hard times, I struggled with how to accept these times and grow from them and learn from them. And it's similar to campaigning. Uh, you know, winning a campaign is certainly really a powerful experience and it's really positive. But losing a campaign, which I've also done, uh, can also be very rewarding because you still learn and, and you still get connected to your community and you still have uh, all of this love and adoration and all these friendships that have been formed. And there's real value in all of that. And being able to see past the loss and recognize all of the good that came from meeting people and getting uh, and, and talking about issues with people and helping people solve problems, um, getting past that initial ugliness of losing and seeing all the rest is, is really part of what grace is all about. Grace is about uh, looking past the hard stuff and seeing the beauty for what for what it is. And, and that was a lot of what I needed to do for myself. And it, it became kind of a great backdrop for uh, a lot of writing. Wow. So I, um, you've selected a poem to read. Uh, uh, I have a few. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so why don't you read your first selection now? All right. So the, the first one is the first poem in the book. Um, and it's a, it's a good one. And it goes to what we were just talking about, actually. Um, Grace doesn't come in the bright light of the day, the full bloom of the most perfect purple dahlia, the glassy still of a hidden pond. It only comes, and we can only learn it, in the fog of morning, where things are not clear, or where the push moves opposite our plans, or in the torrents of a storm, where we lack light to guide our way, or the intense anger of an opponent, a hurt friend who wants to strike back, a former lover still reeling from the pain, an enemy savoring your weakness. In these stark, hard moments where your soul's fire calls you to lash out, grace awaits you, quietly, hopeful, that you'll see that the hard, the intense, the painful, the overwhelming, will eventually pass and that grace will make looking back sweeter and moving forward surer. Uh, there's a so I think powerful, that one, yeah. There's a no, powerful go ahead and say, say what you're going to say. Yeah. There's a powerful message or messages in that because I, I can't imagine anyone in this audience that hasn't gone through one of those circumstances that are in there. Um, so what were you telling them or what were you trying to, what's uh, feeling were you trying to evoke with, with that, that uh, message, with that poem? Well, I, I think getting through those hard moments and really um, seeing those hard moments for what they are, taking them in, learning from them, processing them, um, and moving through them uh, to the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak, is a really powerful way to live. And knowing that you can do that and being confident that you can do that makes life a lot richer and it makes those experiences less debilitating and much more empowering. And I, I think those tough moments can be really empowering if you look at them as uh, with kind of a little bit of grace in your eye, so to speak. Fabulous. That's good. So um, let's ask the audience the second trivia question. So which what is the name of the poem with the line good fences make good neighbors so the name or the title of the poem with the line good fences make good neighbors again first one in with the correct answer will get an autographed copy of untangling grace um powerful messages powerful situations with emotion wrapped into them in very simple words just like you said and it's an art form because you know we could all visualize you know having our heart broken or losing right. a game or any of those and and um and you're saying and, hey and yeah might not be all that bad you gotta work that's right that's right instead of feeling spite or anger or resentment instead of letting those feelings overwhelm you 
if you if you can take a step back and and find grace in those moments and find grace in yourself, uh, you're going to feel stronger and more empowered going forward. And it, and, it, and it's a it's a it's a way of looking at the world and it's a framework for thinking about things that, quite frankly, I think we need more of. Uh, there's not enough grace in the world, both that we give ourselves as well as that we give to the people around us. And if we can uh, make the world a little bit more graceful, maybe our politics would be a little bit more friendly. Maybe our civic engagement would be a little bit more positive. And, uh, you know, I think in general, people might be a little bit happier. Yeah. One of the things you did in the book um, is you sort of aligned uh uh, grace in different categories. Uh, the last one being spirituality. The first one, presence, life, love, uh, stories. You've expressed uh, grace in each one of those. How, how did yep. you come to those broad categories? So it was really just an editing strategy. <laughs> okay. um, the, uh, the, the poems had been written over the course of a year and a half, two years. And I had to, re I went through them all and I picked the ones I thought were most worthy of being put into a compilation. And after I did that, I had, I had a hundred poems sitting in front of me and I needed to organize them in some way. And I started reading through them and trying to find some themes and the themes that, that kind of, there were a number of them about love. There were a number of them that were kind of a story that had grace as kind of the, the, the point of the story. Um, there were some that had clear spiritual messages about prayer and, and kind of divine grace. Um, and there were a numbers that were about kind of the presence of grace. And I started reading about great over the course of this process. I read about grace uh, and was reading other things. People had written about grace and there's really a number of interesting grace has a lot of meetings and the, uh, those poems in this book where multiple meanings of grace are being used and you can kind of divine which ones I'm using depending on the context of the, of the term grace and how it's being used. But grace can be used in a, in a way that means um, kind of beauty. It can be used in a way that if you use the Eastern idea of grace, the Eastern idea of grace is, is kind of about your senses, is about taste and touch, and it's about the things around you and how beautiful they are and how um, you can feel grace. There's obviously the spiritual sense of grace where it's kind of a gift from God. Uh, there's a very humble sense of grace in the Hebrew version of, of grace. There's a humility to it that's really powerful that I think is really interesting. And uh, I use those different forms of grace throughout the poems. And it's really powerful to have a word or a concept like this that can be uh, used in such a broad range of circumstances. It, it, I find it to be a really powerful word and means a lot to me. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it means a lot of different things to um, a lot of different people. Also, you know, you know some people, people say she has grace in the way people walk and move and right. conduct conduct themselves so there's a lot of different things that come up when you think about grace um yep. so another another uh poem or two do you have a poem another poem or two as it relates to this yeah yeah let me um all right this one goes to a little bit of tells you talks a little bit about what i was going through over the last few years when i was writing these poems bravery isn't always easy to spot the bravest moments don't come with thunderous applause. They happen in the dark when you're alone at night, sitting in your bed at 2 a.m., realizing you can no longer ignore the pain you cause others, the pain you cause yourself, that there is no quick fix. Whiplash feelings, unspoken hurt don't end with thinking and wanting and hoping or hiding. Bravery requires you to own the complexity, to own the pain, to own the truth, Bravery tells you that this is you. Yes, it may change your life. Yes, it isn't what you want. Yes, this makes everything unclear. Yes, yes, yes. Bravery requires a breath. Patience. Bravery compels you. Accept the mirror's call. Accept the pain's lesson. Mourn the old truth. Bravery shows you the possible, the new. Take it in. It can be beautiful if you let it. Each new step with grace. That is bravery. That is bravery. 
Uh, that poem obviously uses a number of types of grace. Um, it's got the humi humility of grace. Um, it's got the biblical power of healing, mercy, and love kind of incorporated into it all uh, in self. And then it's got kind of the Greek concept of grace, which is to be glad or delighted, which, you know, to be delighted in the things that are happening to you, even if they're hard. And uh, I try, tried to take all these difficult things going on and say, if you look at them with bravery and, and grace in your eye, uh, you can see something beautiful in it. Uh, another one that kind of really flips the, and this is a whimsical poem, and I think it's a, it's a good juxtaposition to the previous one. This is the 13th poem in the book. It's called, uh, it doesn't have, none of my poems are titled, but this one is, um, I wrote this after uh, my daughter said something to me and it made me, uh, it made me laugh and it made me uh, uh, write this poem. I want to turn a five-year-old's vision into glasses, tortoise shell or black, red or transparent, it doesn't matter. For this sight would be so clear Five-year-olds see the wow in a seashell and the wow in tall grass. They see wow in the clouds and wow in the night. They see wow in a crayon's colors and wow in a mess. They see wow in life's chaos and wow in a twirly dress. They see wow in an ocean and wow in a stream. They see wow in a rainbow and on a snowy day. They see wow in dinosaurs and wow in a cat's play. They see wow in a mud puddle and wow in a dream. They find wow under rocks and on top of dried things. They see wow in their family and wow in their friends. They see wow in a puppy and wow in the sands. They see wow in grace and wow in kindness and wow in sharing too. A five-year-old child wakes to wow every day. They can't turn it off. They see it all with wow. I want to see wow like that. Where can I get those glasses? Oh yes, I just have to look inside me. The glasses are there. Where did I put those? So those are both very different poems. Uh, and the last one obviously yeah. was much about the delight of grace. Uh, grace is just this delightful thing and it, 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 we should all be delighted with grace with everything around us. Yeah, well, wow is right. I mean, um, Again, you, you know, using very few words, uh, you encapsulated how the innocence of childhood is so amazing and that we should appreciate that. This is my take on that reading. And, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that's, that's a, uh, a hint for the, um, the adults to take a, uh, a cue from and say, you know, we, we need to appreciate more and start and stop, you know, doing some of the things we do and I just take what we, the good things in. Right. The first right. one was a little, bravery was a little different. That one was, it's kind of, it says, you know, you don't have to be beating your chest all the time to be brave. So it's a different message, much different That's right. message. Yeah. And uh, but both, had, but both, both, both have grace as, as the underlying, kind of web that holds them together. And I, I think that's what's amazing about grace is, it, it, is if you really embrace grace as a way of thinking about your life, you can see it in everything. Yeah. And, and you know, sometimes you have to look through the glasses so you can mend walls between fen uh, between uh, friends and family that have become fractured. So that's right. um, any, anyway, so um, it's, it's kind of interesting. When, when you see grace from so many different perspectives, because, you know, growing up Christian, you, you, there is a very much a religious um, um, a context in, in what we see and how, and how grace is used. And it's always used in the context of a gift from God. And, and so, um, um, you know, so this, talk about the spiritual side of this more now. Um, yeah, well, so, of, so, of the context, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I, um, my grandma taught me to pray and I grew up praying because my grandma told me you have to say your prayers every night before you go to bed. And I did, uh, throughout a large portion of my life. I, every night before I went to bed, I said my prayers. And, uh, as I got older, my prayers became much more meditations, um, 
But my prayers were probably my first lesson in grace, actually. And I, I, I've thought about this a lot because my grandma told me, you know, during your prayers, you should, you know, bless your family and ask God to look out for your friends and loved ones and uh, all the people in the world and people, even the people who have wronged you in some way, you should, you should ask for uh, blessings on them as well. And that was probably my first real life lesson in grace is, is remembering that everyone around you, whether they harm you or not, deserves to be looked at with grace. Um, yeah. And uh, as I got older, I probably pray less at night, to be, to be totally honest. But I meditate and I, and I think about um, life and I think about the people in my life in, in, in very much the same way. It's probably maybe a more mature way of thinking about things, but, it, but I still do. And that certainly has incorporated itself into some of the poems in the book. Uh, there's a whole section, section on spirituality. Uh, and quite frankly, spirituality is in other parts of the book as well. Um, because that form of grace, uh, where there's some kind of divine power that is helping make love brighter or making things more beautiful, is certainly a part of, of my lived experience, and it, it's found its way into the book. Right. Yeah, I, you know, if you remember, I think one of the greatest uh, song, song lyrics that the, that the Beatles wrote was... Uh, uh, in in my life, uh, and you know, the, the, with the terrific line, in my life I've loved them all, right? And, and reflecting on all of the people that have come and gone through your life, and again, but, but song song lyricists are like poets in a way, I guess. Absolutely. Uh, so yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna give the third trivia question because we seem to have stumped the audience a little bit with uh, good fences make good neighbors. So while they they continue to think on that one, we'll give them the last one. This one's easy. Name a poem by um, uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge other than the rhyme of the ancient mariner. So name a poem by Samuel Taylor Coleridge other than the rhyme of the ancient mariner. So, um, so spirituality and, uh, and the other categories all come together here. So pick a final poem um, that you'd like to send a message with to our audience tonight. And that's okay. That, that, that's a, I have two. Two's one is good. short one. Is, I, they're not that. So one is from the love chapter and one is from the spirituality chapter. Good. Um, so I'll do the love chapter first. This is poem number 55 in the book. There is that moment when it all changes a small gesture, a glass of water brought to you when you didn't ask, but really wanted it. And you realize that the waiting and patience and tolerance of your struggles were as real as a perfect blue sky, were as honest as an afternoon thunderstorm. Time was a test to see if you'd ever see it, if you'd understand how deep the hold was, how true it was, and you smile because there was so much to get through, so much and your eyes tear, because you had to remember how to trust and fall and be caught to find grace. And it took a while and you didn't think you'd get there. So as the glass of water gets pushed in front of you and you are fully seen in a way nobody has, you look up and you grab the water and take a sip and you hope it lasts forever. Wow. And that one obviously touches on love. It touches on kind of the very Eastern concept of, of grace that talks about lived experiences of sight and taste and sound and touch and smell. Uh, it has a little spirituality in there with love as a gift. Um, but it's really just that moment when you realize how much beauty there is in being seen by another human being and how grace, how much grace is in that. And just really powerful moment that I think a lot of people have had different experiences with and uh, was, was important for me as well. And the last one, which I will close on is, is almost a prayer. This is poem 88 in the book. I pray for the grace to give thanks today for past friends and new, regardless of where they stay to push angry thoughts and impatience out of my heart's space, knowing everybody has to fight their life's battles with uncommon grace. 
I pray for the grace to be thankful today, to appreciate with gratitude each breath I can take, to humbly honor my life's people in whatever form they take, to love what I'm blessed with and see its truth. I pray that everybody has thanks today, that all people pause and see the good where it lay, that we all put aside the hate from the past, that we all recognize that anger and pain and hurt can't last, that we hug friends and family tight, that we push ourselves to see the joy in a graceful night. I pray for the grace of thanks for all of us today, to remember former friends and current, to warm ourselves with gratitude's torrent. Wow. That was terrific. Um, you're right, pow powerful message, um, pulling together all diff different aspects of grace. You know, the one that I enjoyed um, was number 90, or the one on page 99. And it says- I almost read that one, I almost- <laughs> But don't, let's not let's not read that one because we'll leave that for the folks to go buy the book and read it. And it's it says what I want to be remembered for basically. And um, if you go through that, <laughs> I, I think you do a lot of reflecting. And I think that was your point with that one. It was my point. It's, it's a very powerful message. So go out, get the book. Um, Work your way through it, and when you get to number ninety-nine, you'll be ready for one hundred. So that's right. Uh, so what's next for Rob? Where, what's what's going on from here? Do you see a follow-up to this? Um, what's what's next? Back so, to public service. I, I, so yeah, back to public service. I <laughs> maybe back to public service at some point. Never say never to public service. Um, right. It's an honor to be able to do it. The uh, there, there's going to be another collection of poems. Uh, I've written a lot during COVID. Uh, I look forward to a chance to be able to do more readings. The, the <coughs> downside of COVID is is uh, poetry readings have kind of gone by the wayside. So I'm hopeful that poetry readings will come back into 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 style, and I can go do some more of those. Um, I'm often at Busboys and Poets. I love uh, their poetry nights, and I I try to read when I can, and I like to listen to the other poets. Uh, but definitely another collection of poems. I I still jot poems down on a fairly regular basis as a way of kind of processing the world. And uh, otherwise, keep my restaurant and bar f afloat uh, as we pull out of the pandemic and, uh, and hopefully find ways to live my own life with grace, uh, which is not easy every day and it takes work and uh, I, I do the best I can. Yeah. Well, yes, that's about all we can do. And congratulations on the work. It's, 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 it's truly a work of art more than it is a book. And uh, before we sign off, let's, let's give one more chance. We have two open questions out there. Um, good, fa uh, good Fences Make Good Neighbors um, is the title of what poem? Or is, what is the title of the poem it's from? And name any poem by Samuel Taylor Coleridge other than the rhyme of the ancient mariner. So um, let's give them a minute. But yes, I enjoyed I enjoyed uh, your readings. They made the the uh, the poems even more powerful. And uh, it, thank you. It was very good to hear them. And we're getting um, uh, we've got Kelly on the on the on the uh, good fences make good neighbors, and um, and uh, she's getting close, but nobody has the right answer yet. <laughs> <laughs> And I tell you, I, I, I don't. Tell yeah. Well, I've, I was just going to say, I, oh, Susan's got something. Yeah. No, yeah. no, I don't have. A, I don't have a winner. Um, I um, Kelly is giving lots of hints. She knows that she already won sure. a book, so she she's not giving the whole thing, but she she is giving some hints. I can um, win another book and give it away. That's true, Kelly. Uh, mending walls. We got it, it by away. Nancy. All right, Nancy Gorski, mending walls. So. She came in. Oh, there she is. So, Nancy Gorski got it. Thank you. I didn't even see that. Fantastic. Congratulations, yeah. Nancy. Thanks for playing. Okay, so, but that doesn't, we still have the naming another poem by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Let's see if anybody gets it while we say goodbye. So in two, no, next Tuesday, we have another terrific uh, young author, as they all seem to be, uh, taking a, a look at the, um, the, 
the new builders, as she calls them, those folks on Main Street that are helping build America in a very innovative fashion. So that will be a um, um, up. And Kelly got Cristobal as one of the, the Samuel Taylor College poems. I was, I was trying to see if anybody came in with Kubla Khan, but that's okay. <laughs> Congratulations, so, Kelly. Right. And so it'll be another fascinating show. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a topic that I think is going to be, again, engaging for people uh, to hear what's going on in rebuilding America, ground up uh, different folks. Um, and it's not all w Wall Street. All right. Well, thank you, Rob. You've been a t wonderful guest. Glad to have you thank on. Thank you. And next time I'm in Old Town or in, in Virginia uh, and staying at night at friends or family, I'm, we're going to come up to Captain Gar Gregory's. Love that place. That sounds great. I look forward to seeing you. Excellent. Yeah. Rob, thank you so much. Your poems really touched a lot of people. Um, you're having a, a lot of a lot of love here on the on the comments. So thank you so yeah. much for joining us. And we'll see you um, again, either at Elizabeth's or at Captain Gregory's. Probably Captain Gregory's. Yeah. Probably Captain so Gregory's. <laughs> and less calories. Yeah, right. That's exactly. Right. <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, and Ralph, thank you. We'll see you on Tuesday the 5th. Right. Thanks. Okay. All right, guys. Good night. Okay. That's going to do it for us tonight for ZTV. Thank you all for watching and thank you for playing Ralph's great trivia games. Be sure to tune in to ZTV tomorrow night, Thursday. Uh, Alisa Kovach will be here on Make It Alexandria and her guest is the fabulous Bill Butcher from Port City Brewing Company, which is I think a lot of people's favorite brewing company around here. I know I was happened to just be there on Sunday enjoying a beautiful day sitting outside having a cold beer. It was heaven, absolute heaven. And Port City is a wonderful brewery. So meet Bill um, with um, Elisa, who's a wonderful host of her show, Make It Alexandria. That's tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. And until then, and whenever you can, remember to be the good news in someone's life.